The early 90s saw the greatest format war that never actually happened. Philips DCC versus Sony Minidisc. While both had the goal of replacing compact cassettes with higher quality digital audio, some early reviews said that DCC's sound quality held an edge. But is that actually true? Let's find out. In order to fit a decent amount of music onto their respective media, both digital compact cassette and mini disc had to employ lossy audio compression. If you're familiar with the concept of MP3 files, then this shouldn't need much explanation. But the specific codecs each format used were different, and when the two launched in late 1992, reviewers were able to tell them apart. Generally speaking, both sounded very good, at least when it came to casual listening. There was no clear consensus as to which was better, but it seemed like initial impressions generally leaned towards DCC as sounding closer to the quality of compact discs. And if you took a brief glance at both formats' technical specs, it would be easy to infer that DCC was overall better than Minidisc but the truth is a lot more nuanced. It all comes down to the compression algorithm. DCC uses a codec called Precision Adaptive Subband Coding, or PASC. It has a fixed data rate of 384 kilobits per second, or about one quarter the size of an uncompressed PCM signal, like that of a CD. Sony's A-Track algorithm, short for Adaptive Transform Acoustic Coding, instead operates at 292 kilobits per second, closer to one-fifth the rate of a CD. One could take these numbers at face value and conclude that Minidisc would sound worse, but there's a lot more going on that levels the playing field. Sony had developed A-Track on its own after a lot of research into psychoacoustics, or the study of how our brains perceive sound. A-Track splits the incoming signal into three main frequency bands for processing, ultimately using a total of 52 sub-bands to figure out what parts of the audio would be inaudible, so it could discard them to save space. Something Sony took into account was the fact that our hearing isn't equally sensitive across the entire frequency range. In general, we're better at picking out details in lower frequencies than in higher ones. Accordingly, those 52 subbands aren't equally sized. Rather, those that handle lower frequencies are narrower. This gives A-Track more precision in figuring out how to compress the signal. Basically, it's able to keep more detail in the frequencies where we're more likely to notice them. Incoming audio is processed in blocks, and Sony designed A-Track so that those blocks can be different sizes. Audio that changes quickly gets coded into smaller blocks, again in an effort to preserve detail. Philips, on the other hand, took a different path. Its PASC codec is really just a minor tweak to the MPEG-1 Layer 1 algorithm. The encoding process uses 32 sub-bands, and each one is the same size. Unlike Minidisc, DCC could support 48 kHz sample rates and not just the CD standard 44.1, but at the same time, recording in mono did not double the runtime like it did with MD. But since it was based on a third-party standard, PASC did effectively get a head start on development over A-Track. Work on MPEG-1 started in 1987, and the standard was released in late 1991, meaning there was plenty of time for Philips to use it as the basis for PASC before DCC's debut a year later. Sony was under a bit tighter of a deadline with A-Track, meaning there wasn't as much time to work out the bugs if Minidisc was to launch alongside DCC, which was very important from a business strategy perspective. So ultimately, A-Track was generally a more efficient codec than PASC, which let it get away with a lower bitrate. Complaints about Minidisc's sound quality are better chalked up to the fact that, in some ways, the format was rushed to market. Not only did Sony have to do all the software engineering for A-Track, it also had to design custom silicon to use it. 
going with a dedicated large-scale integration, or LSI, chip was key to Minidisc's focus on portability and good battery life. PASC, on the other hand, was a bit more mature when the first DCC recorders went on the market. With reviews of the two formats generally being very close when it came to sound quality, it's probably best to listen to them yourself. So let's do that. I prepared a couple of sample recordings using a first generation DCC deck, a Philips DCC 900, as well as Sony's first mini disc device, the MZ1. The source audio came from lossless files and was recorded digitally over an optical connection, so as to take any analog conversion circuitry out of the picture. Likewise, the samples were then played back and captured digitally, so the only differences between them should just be their compression algorithms. Of course, YouTube will apply its own compression to this video, so don't try to take this as an example of these formats' absolute sound quality. Rather, just try to pick out how they differ, and be sure to listen using good headphones or speakers. And if you like the music, I've included links in the video description. Could you tell the difference? Because honestly, I'm not sure I can. If there are any, to my ears at least, they're so subtle as to really be inconsequential. The mini disc maybe sounded ever so slightly cleaner in the low end, which makes sense given what we know about how a track works, but both are equally enjoyable for me to listen to. I suspect that any audible differences noted in those reviews from the early 90s were more likely related to either the digital-to-analog circuitry in the decks, 
for the recordings themselves. I have seen anecdotes online that pre-recorded mini-discs don't sound as good as ones consumers recorded on their own, for example. And this would make sense if you consider that both Philips and Sony had to produce duplication equipment well in advance of both formats' launches, so that a selection of music titles were available on day one. Perhaps PASC was further along in development by that point, whereas Sony was still in a mad dash to get A-Track to sound as good as it could. But one of the key things about A-Track is since Sony developed it in-house, it was also free to improve it whenever it wanted. And the company did exactly that. With subsequent generations of mini-disc recorders, A-Track's encoding quality was incrementally improved, all while maintaining backwards compatibility for playback with older hardware. Philips was largely reliant on the developers of the MPEG codec for any changes, but since it sounded so good at launch and the DCC format generally saw poor sales, any effort to increase sound quality likely wouldn't have been worth the effort. I prepared one more audio test between the DCC900 and MZ1, but this time also included my MZ-R700 in the mix. That model dates back to 2001 and uses A-Track version 4.5. I played its recording back through the MZ-1 so that the audio decoding process would be the same. And as before, I only used digital connections. Yeah, not much difference here either. The recording from the R700 may sound slightly smoother in the high end, but again, you'd have to really know the source material well to be able to pick out such a subtle difference. There may be a bigger impact with different genres of music, but since both DCC and Minidisc were advertised as general consumer formats, it stands to reason that the majority of owners listened to popular music. The fact that both of these used lossy compression was reason enough for serious audiophiles to dismiss them outright. But to me, they're equally great. Also, a brief note for the keyboard warriors out there. Mini disc recorders often had a note on the bottom that referred to patents licensed from Dolby. Digital formats like MD didn't need that company's noise reduction technology like what was commonly seen in cassette decks, so some might be led to believe that A-Track could have been something Dolby created. As it turns out, during A-Track's development, Sony's engineers found that the concept of adaptive-sized data blocks had already been patented by Dolby. It was an important enough concept to the codec that Sony simply decided to license it, instead of spend the additional time and resources trying to develop an alternative. A-Track was absolutely something Sony created, and they have several patents to show for it. Lossy audio compression was a novel and somewhat polarizing concept in the early 90s, one that put off audiophiles and is part of the reason why neither DCC nor Minidisc saw much growth at first. Did nitpicking over which of the two sounded better really have much of an impact on their sales? I doubt it. Each faced its own bigger struggles in other ways. But given how they both utilized compressed digital audio almost a decade before MP3 files saw mass adoption, it's hard to argue that these two didn't at least start to lay the groundwork for how we primarily listen to music today. <laughs> 